this video, I'd like to show you a little bit about how a computer goes about solving a network analysis problem. Now, in the last video, we were looking at a variety of different questions that network analysis can help us to answer, and a lot of different problems that network analysis can help us solve, because there is a whole lot more to it than just finding the route from A to B, like we do when we access Google Maps. We looked at a variety of different questions, and there were a whole lot more that transportation networks are used to answer. And then also when you get into utility networks, there are a whole lot of things that utility networks can help us to get to the answer to. And that's why people can go to a tremendous amount of trouble to create their own custom transportation and utility networks in their GIS because they have very specialized questions and very specialized applications that they want to apply them. Uh, two. But let's take a look here because we don't have time to go over all of these different kinds of questions in detail uh, in this introduction. But let's go ahead and take a look at a basic least cost path problem solving because this is the kind of problem solving that Google does uh, when, it, when you go and search Google Maps. We're looking for directions from A to B. Basically, we're looking at least cost path between A and B. That's what it's called in a more technical sense. So in order to go over how it solves this, let me introduce you to a couple of terms. And the first one is the solver. When you're talking about network analysis, you have a variety of different solvers for the different kinds of problems that you uh, have got or the different kinds of questions that you want to answer. And so if you go into a GIS package with network uh, analysis capabilities, you're going to have a variety of different solvers that uh, you can choose from based on the kind of question that you want to answer. And each one of these solvers has a different algorithm that is used to compute the solution to a certain problem. And basically what the solver is going to return to you is some selection of edges or junctions that answer your question. You get to choose that. Some uh, questions, it makes more sense to have edges. Some of them, it makes more sense to have junctions as the answer. Some of them have both. But Basically, what's going to happen is you have your network of junctions, points, of edges, lines set up with all the specialized information that it requires. And then you're going to ask it some question, like in this case, what is the least cost path between two different points? And then it will return a selection of nodes and junctions, or junctions and edges, that answer that question. So also, we have this term flag. Sometimes these flags are called pins, and when you're working with a, a GIS uh, doing network analysis, you get to establish these flags, and these flags are basically points of interest that you are specifying. And we do exactly this when we use Google Maps. Now, their shape is often that little circle with the, the point at the bottom, the triangle on the bottom. That's its flag or that's its pin. We establish these pins in Google Maps by going in and typing in an address, and it geocodes it and drops that pin, that flag, down on top of that address. Then we say we want to go to some other location. We type that in, and it drops the geocodes the pin drops that flag down on the other address. And that tells us, and that's how we specify our points of interest in Google Maps. In dedicated GIS software about network analysis, you could go in and just put a location you know, with, a, with the mouse about where your flags are. But your flags are just specifying your points of interest for a particular network analysis problem. If, you're, if you are doing something like the traveling salesman problem, a flag would identify where home is. And then other flags would identify where all of your customers are that you've got to visit. So that's how we're setting up uh, our places of interest. We can also establish barriers. I might not also I might not talk about that a whole lot in this video, but when you're doing uh, GIS analysis, you can uh, enable and disable nodes, or junctions, and edges. I say node sometimes. I mean to say junctions to keep my uh, terminology consistent. You can specify to enable or disable a junction or an edge temporarily by the use of a barrier, by just establishing a barrier, sometimes even by clicking on it with the mouse. Now, we did say that we can enable and disable junctions and edges uh, on, on a whole very systematically, because if we have information in the attribute table, such as that this particular edge is only suitable for bike traffic, then we want to disable it when we're running a least cost path, least cost path problem when we're trying to do automobile traffic.
So we can do that systematically, or we can do this in a very ad hoc way, like we were giving the example of maybe trying to route traffic for a parade. And so if we're going to be doing some network analysis on how the traffic flow of the uh, city is going to be on a particular day when the parade's going on, we might just put up temporary these barriers to temporary dis temporarily disable those edges along uh, in the network data set so that we can run the analysis. So we can temporarily uh, disable different junctions and edges. Okay, so let me give you a very simple example of a network. Let's say that this is our network over here, and we can see that we have some edges here, and we also have junctions where all of the edges meet, and I've established two flags here. I've established this red flag down here at the bottom, and I've established that purple flag up there at the top. And so those are my points of interest in this analysis. And I want to ask the computer, what is the least cost path? What's the shortest distance between the red flag and the purple flag? That's where I, the red flag is where I am, the purple flag is where I want to go. What is the least cost path between those two? If you were to get out the least cost path solver and ask it that question, it would return this. Now in this case, I just have it uh, returning, returning, having it select edges. I don't have it selecting that junction there. But I've got those blue edges highlighted because the computer says that is the shortest path between the two flags. Now, you might be thinking, well, that are you sure that's right? Are you sure that's the least, uh, the least cost path, the shortest distance? Well, uh, because you might be thinking, well, we kind of have a right triangle here. That's kind of how I set it up. And we've got the edges of the right triangle down there at the bottom and on the right. But then we should know that the hypotenuse of a right triangle should be the shortest distance between the two points, not going along the rest of the right triangle. And of course, the network as it's set up between the uh, red and purple flags isn't the perp perfect hypotenuse of the uh, right triangle, but since it more closely follows the hypotenuse than what's currently highlighted, you'd think, oh, well, that's the shortest path. But yet, this is what the computer returns. And so why is that? Well, it is because, by default, the cost to get from one point to another on the network is going to be calculated by the least number of edges traversed. The computer wants to know what's the least number of edges that I'm going to have to traverse in order to get from flag to flag. So in this case, you can easily tell that the computer has found two. There's the uh, line along the bottom there and then the line along the top. And those are the uh, only two edges in this case that I have to traverse. If I were to take the other route, then I've got, oh, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 different edges that I have to take between the red and purple flag. So according to the computer's default parameters, that's the longer route. Well, how do we fix this? Maybe we say, no, what I'm really interested in is not the number of edges I have to traverse. Maybe that's not the important thing to me. It's probably not. It's probably not what we expect Google Maps to give you. We say, hey, what I want is total distance. Total up the distance. Well, in order to do that, the computer will do that for you. I have to introduce you to the idea of weight or cost. We need to assign a weight or a cost to these junctions and these edges that it's going to cost someone if they're going to travel along it. So what is a weight or a cost? Well, a weight or a cost, this, this can be very general. When, what you might be thinking about most obvious, obviously, is distance. I don't want just the number of edges that I'm traversing over here. I really want to uh, minimize, maybe, distance. So if we went into the attribute table for each one of these edges into our attribute table, and we put in a column, and we called it maybe length and then either manually or went through with the computer and had it calculate the length of every single one of these sections and then put that, you know, the sections of the edges and then put that length into the attribute column. Then what I would do is say, hey computer, 
Let's run this least cost path problem solving uh, solver again, but this time rather than just counting the number of edges as you go, I want you to total the amount of length that each edge is. I want you to use the length as a cost. And so the computer would do that. Then I want you to minimize the route. So the computer would go one, two, but it would add whatever the length of this line is and then add the length of this line and come up with that as the total cost to get from the red flag to the purple flag along this route. Then it would add up all of the uh, lengths for all of these, uh, these shorter edges in here as it goes. And if this length is shorter, then it would say, oh, okay, and it would swap the selection here. It would say, oh, then you need to travel this route if you're trying to minimize length. Another very obvious thing that you might want to minimize is time. Maybe in the attribute table as well for each one of these, uh, we have the speed limit. If I have the speed limit for every one of these edges, so you see this is the very specialized data set that you're trying to build up, I need the speed limit for each one of these edges. If I have the speed limit recorded in my attribute table, then it, it shouldn't be hard at all for me to tell the GIS, please use the length and the speed limit to do a computation to tell me the total amount of time that it takes me to traverse this edge. Okay, if you know the length, and you know the speed that you can travel, you should figure out, be able to easily figure out with a simple computation how much time it should take you. So you might say, run this again and give me a solver, but this time minimize my time. Maybe if these are all local roads, then my total distance might be less, but maybe I'm going 35 miles an hour and I'm having to snake my way through these local roads here. Whereas maybe, as far as total time goes again, maybe this is a major highway. So I can just jump on the highway, go shing right over here to this uh, junction, and then swoop right up here to purple, and it will cost me less time because I'm able to travel faster along this. So I could tell it to minimize time. And those are both very common things to to do, and I think that even Google Maps will allow you to say, or and, and many different navigation software will allow you to use the least cost path solver and then swap back and forth between are you trying to minimize distance or are you trying to minimize time and have the computer rerun the calculations for you. You should notice, by the way, that this looks a lot like what Google Maps does return. You know, when we were playing around with Google Maps, you do get a highlight. You get the selection of the roads that you're supposed to take for that particular solution, right? So it does give you the selection of that vector data set that it's got. But you know, I can also assign costs to my junctions. So it might actually cost something to go through a junction. So you can assign a cost to a junction as well. And think about that. You know, if you're talking about just routing here, which we're talking about just you know, like automobile routing, it may cost you something to travel through a junction. If this junction is a stop sign, well, you're going to have to slow your car down. You're going to have to stop and then potentially wait for somebody else to go through the intersection and then make your turn. So I've seen calculations where they not only have attribute information for all of the edges, but at each junction, it's giving you an amount of time that it takes to get through that junction. If it's a stop sign, it may take you a few seconds. But it could be more than that. Maybe this is a traffic light, and you know that if you're traveling through that light, on average at least, how long does a person have to wait in order to get through that light? Okay, maybe you approach it and it's green this time and you can just go through it. Maybe you catch it so you have to sit through the whole red light cycle. Maybe you're someplace in between, but on average, what can you expect somebody to spend in time to get through one of these junctions, and that can be significant. And that can change in different directions. You know, we can get even more sophisticated with it because, you know, you've probably been in a circumstance where this is a major road right here, and this is a minor road here, and here's a, a junction with a traffic light. And if you're going this way or you're going that way, you know, the light stays green for quite a while, and it's pretty easy to go through this junction in this direction. But if you are here, this is a minor road, and you sit here, you feel like, oh, I wait forever in order to get the light to make this turn or that turn 
or whatever it is that I'm trying to do, or even go all the way through. So we can get even more sophisticated with this. We can put in the cost to these junctions, and we can tell the junction what the cost is, the average cost, depending on where you are and what turn you're trying to make. We can put all of that in there, and if you want to get real sophisticated with it, you certainly can. You can also uh, update these costs sort of on the fly. Like, you know, we can put in temporary barriers and so forth. Well, how do they keep track of uh, things like the traffic conditions? Well, what they're doing is they're adjusting the time here. They're adjusting the weight in sort of real time inside their database. Oh, we're getting some new information here in. The, the cost the, in time to travel along this particular edge isn't just computed by the length and the speed limit, but we're having high traffic. The When we have a high traffic volume, it reduces, well, I guess that reduces the speed that you're able to travel, but when we get high traffic volume, we also have to account for the speed they're actually traveling, not just the speed limit of the road, which you could potentially travel, but high traffic volume, that's increasing the time. And so in those situations, this isn't just a static data set. They have a, a, a very active database of this with new information coming in from road sensors or reports or however they're getting it so that when somebody tries to you know, rerun this solver, it's giving them, uh, a, a, it's, it's adjusting the weights based on real-time data. And so that's, uh, that's something uh, that's, uh, that's really important and you know, I'm seeing a lot now and I'm sure it's only going to become more common. You know, we don't have to talk about just this in, in terms of distance and time. You know, you might talk about a cost directly in money. Sometimes it directly costs money to travel along maybe this edge right here. Maybe this is a toll. And so in order to pay that, you've got to pay a toll to get through here. Maybe this one over here is toll as well. And you want to minimize the amount of money that you're directly having to pay. Uh, I think I've, I've seen that in some navigation software, no toll roads, for instance. Give me one that's not that I'm not going to have to pay anything or minimize the amount of tolls that I'm going to have to uh, pay in order to uh, get from point A to point B. We can get even more creative with this. You know, we're, we're talking about automobile traffic right here, but what if you're talking about walking? What's the cost in walking? Well, somebody may be interested in distance, they may be interested in time, but you know, I've seen some very interesting things done with uh, calories. Direct energy expenditure. Because it may cost more energy for a person to walk along a certain edge than another edge. Right now, we're kind of looking at this in two dimensions, but you know, if you're looking at this in profile, you may have a really flat profile, or you could be going uphill. And it's going to take a lot more energy to go uphill than it is if you're a flat area. So maybe this uh, is a real flat thing to walk along, a real flat path to walk along. But this is really steep. You know, this goes uphill. And then maybe down. So maybe this is costing more calories. And there are equations that you can come up with and you can put into the GIS software and you can do the calculations in order to come up with how many calories is it going to uh, take the typical human being or cost the typical human being in order to uh, travel along a particular path. And then you can adjust the equations from there and get even more specific. From there, you can put in your weight, your height, your gender, and then have it calculate uh, calories more accurately for you. So we've got to think uh, very broadly about cost, okay? It could be distance, time, those are easy. It could be directly money. It could be something a lot more interesting. And we can input all of those into a GIS when we're doing network analysis, if that's what you're uh, interested in doing. And we can sort of break away from just what Google Maps gives us. Well, that's the basic idea behind least cost path problem solving. It's the basic idea that Google Maps uses, and it is in many ways our sort of most basic GIS network analysis problem that is done with uh, transportation networks. But even though it's basic, like I said, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can do with it, especially if you're getting into uh, some really interesting costs that are being imposed, and particularly if you have real sophisticated networks. Uh, this is uh, something that could still be really fun to do. But there are other solvers 
but uh, we'll just stick with these. I hope that uh, having gone through this, you have a little bit more insight into the computation that even Google Maps is doing. What is uh, sort of behind Google Maps when we use it and just ask for our location and then directions to someplace else. Uh, I think that uh, it's a pretty interesting thing to know because we do use it so often. We tend to not think about those things. We kind of kind of take it for granted. So there's a kind of behind the scenes look at what's going on. So I hope you learned something and enjoyed this kind of behind the scenes look at uh, what makes Google Maps work.